Since 1929, our third Wednesday of the month, Middletown Luncheon Club provides great food, quality community gathering, and interesting local speakers. Come join us. So our speaker today is Mr. Jim Steele. Jim holds an AA degree in business, BA degree in biology, and MA degree in pollution biology. He has a professional forester's license and taught university level courses in freshwater ecology and environmental policy and administration as an adjunct professor. Jim took up residency in Lake County in 2007, building his own home and becoming a vocal advocate for Clear Lake. And he has most recently retired from, you guys know, right? From the Board of Supervisors, District 3. So welcome to retirement, and thank you very much for being our speaker today, Jim. Yeah, I'm going to talk about a little about uh, Clear Lake today. Uh, I've studied all the research on Clear Lake over time. In fact, I've worked on lakes all over California. And I'm a member of the uh, North American Lake Manager Society, so I'm kind of up to date on the, uh, the science of lakes. And, and Clear Lake actually is a very unique lake uh, in the world because it is the oldest natural warm water ecosystem in both North and South America. <clears throat> it's over a million years old, and it's been around in a warm water area which ordinarily would be filled in by now with sediment, and that sediment, of course, would come from the mountains, and it would be turned into a valley, but it has not. Ordinarily, these valleys around you, which used to be lakes, fill in in about 10,000 to 100,000 years, and so all of the valleys you see are old lakes. Your Great Lakes, for instance, are only about 10 to 15,000 years old, and this one's a million years old. There is a reason for that, and that is that there's a big fault block in the center of it that keeps sinking. As plate tectonics squeeze the, the lake, it creates a half-inch sink just about every year on the average, and there's about 900 meters, that is a half mile, of sediment that is filled in. So this lake would have been filled in many times over, except for the fact of earthquakes and that sort of thing that goes on. Now you get this beautiful lake view and you also get beautiful after hours views. This is an amazing place. Not only is it old, it has volcanoes everywhere and sightseeing everywhere you go, but we get these beautiful uh, nighttime skies. And the other thing that you get are beautiful dark skies. You can actually see the planets here in the, in the Milky Way, whereas people in the Bay Area probably have never seen the Milky Way and didn't know they were looking at their own galaxy. So they can come up here and they can see two galaxies with the naked eye, one of them being the Milky Way. And the other one being our closest uh, neighbor, which is Andromeda. This is an artist's conception, but you can see it with your naked eye. You put a scope on it, you can tell that it's a galaxy. It's pretty amazing. <clears throat> the next slide shows fishing. We are the number one bass fishing lake in California and probably one, two, or three, depending on who rates it, in the United States. So there's a lot of bass here and it's people from all over come here to do their fishing. Tournaments in Lake County uh, can number anyway from 40 to 100 tournaments on any given year. And these tournaments basically bring the economy in on the, the fishing side. Now, how many fish are there in this uh, lake? There's probably the largest number of fish per acre in Clear Lake than there are in the United States. And that's by a lot of estimates from people who have studied this sort of thing. And there's so many fish that in fact, they're jumping out of the water. This is something we don't want here. An invasive species actually uh, are part of the problem with the lake, trying to keep them out and making sure that we don't lose the lake from its natural beauty. It's right on the verge of a lot of things that we shouldn't have, but that's one that's uh, invading the um, Great Lakes right now and the Mississippi Lakes and the Mississippi River, and that's the Asian carp. Uh, they jump out of the water when they're disturbed. We do have a lot of bait fish here. These are fish that are, um, at certain times of the year will breed along the shoreline and of course then we get the white pelicans and other birds that come in and then work them over. Right now you can travel around Clear Lake and you can see probably a thousand white pelicans that are doing their work on the, uh, the fish population. <clears throat> we also get a lot of fires. 
Fires are a normal, a natural landscape uh, aspect of living in this kind of environment. Over 50 years, if you look at the fire history, the large fire history, there's uh, probably been, this has got to be a little bit further away from me. It's probably been um, 104 fires in 50 years by count. And so this is a natural part of the landscape. These fires are getting to be bigger as we go forward because of the drought and other aspects of climate change, but the same number. The same number, we haven't changed the number of fires in Lake County over uh, 50 years for sure and in the state over the last 100 years. And my, as a forester that I've looked at, uh, it hasn't changed throughout uh, California's history. What's happened though, we get the mega fires. But what's also happening is the nutrients that it unloads comes into the lake. And it comes in through rainstorms and a lot of sediment comes along with it. A lot of material comes in to bring the nutrients into the lake. <clears throat> Some of it is not, uh, is kind of uncontrolled as you see here. This is a slip out of a, a road bank and then of course it runs into the lake. And that, uh, those nutrients can create a cyanobacteria problem for a visitor economy. Visitors that are here in the summertime when the cyanobacteria is here, they don't like it. And um, yeah, thanks, I get a little feedback. Uh, they don't like that. <clears throat> uh, basically, the problem for the visitors are the snake and getting the green legs, and then if your dog happens to drink the water in the wrong spot, and it's a toxic cyanobacteria, you could lose an animal, and that's all happened. There's one dog I know of here, and there's a dog over in, um, uh, let's see, where was the Russian River? Had a uh, incident where they had a cyanobacteria blow. So toxins are starting to become part of the landscape because of the warmer environment. And it looks like uh, we're gonna have to make some changes in order to move away from the uh, toxic cyanobacteria environment. Next thing is that uh, you've gotta look at from the standpoint of the different species of cyanobacteria. The one in the previous slide was one species. This one here is a lingbia. Lingbia, when it dies, it floats to the surface. It keeps floating to the surface, creating mats that get thicker. And this one stinks, it stinks like sulfur. Uh, and of course, in the summertime is when you're gonna have this. Uh, this was in 2011. We haven't had this kind of lingbia since then. What, uh, where's all this coming from? Well, one thing that's unique about uh, Clear Lake is the size of the watershed. If you take all these three colors together, that's 480 square miles that feed a 60 square mile lake. If you were to look at Lake Tahoe, it only has, and it's twice as big as, uh, about three times as big as uh, Clear Lake, it only has a 48 mile, 45 mile square mile watershed. So 45 square miles for Tahoe, all nice and clean, fresh rock, a lot of sediment, a lot of sediment that could come into the lake, 480 square miles would feed this lake. So what we need, of course, is a look at what happens in that upper watershed because it's gonna affect the lake. The blue area was what fed the large basin, and that large basin basically is where most of the water comes in, 70% of the water, and over 70% of the sediment. And you look back up in the corner there, you'll see it coming in through Middle Creek, and that is uh, the major area where sediment comes in. It also will come down through all of this <clears throat> Kelseyville area where it's a lot of um, farming. Uh, Great Valley, this uh, farming comes in here and you'll see a little bit of material that comes in there. And that basically is the most amount that comes in is through the Middle Creek. If you look at Middle Creek from the air, when it's a, a drought and the water is the lowest it can be, I uh, forgot what year with this, um, when was the last time we had a drought? It was 2008 or seven, something like that. <clears throat> That's a 25 acre island of sediment that has flown in through Middle Creek into the lake. So it's out there, you just can't see it. You're only gonna see it when you get this low water period. And all of that is what's coming in the lake because of the levees that make it go through everything else and transports it to the lake. The next slide shows the wetland above that. This is the area that you can see all the levees there. That's the areas that used to be bean fields and, and rice uh, farming. Uh, that's a 1,400 acre parcel that has been underway for purchasing and restoring back into uh, the uh, Middle Creek wetland. So that's the Middle Creek wetland project. That's so that we can take down the levees and that sediment can filter and settle out there rather than go into the lake. 
You can see erosive processes all over the lake if you, if you look for them as you drive Highway 29. Highway 29 coming from Lower Lake going up to um, uh, Lakeport. And you'll see off to your right as you drive along what looks like a Grand Canyon. Most of you have seen that. Well, that's what it looks from the air. This was a big vernal pool area right here. It was wet uh, all year long until it dried out. Beautiful flowers, that sort of thing. The guy that purchased it back at the turn of the century wanted to farm it. And so he basically cut through a notch so that it could drain into Lake Thurston. And it started an erosive process that you see going on still today. You can also see kind of a circle right here that it's following. That at one time before he did that work, that was a racetrack where people were running around in a circle. And uh, cause the erosion process is starting to follow that racetrack. Now there's other influences on the lake because of human activity. This is uh, Sulphur Bank Mine. That's the Thurman Pit and the Herman Pit. And the Herman Pit uh, basically uh, was one of the mine things that uh, were, they've cut it off so that the water uh, doesn't flow directly into the lake. And uh, one of the things that people talk about are, is the mercury pollution that goes into the lake. And that mercury pollution is the conversation for the lake, more so than it really creates a problem for human activity, other than eating the fish. And the fish are no more polluted than they are in 50% of the lakes in California. It's about the same level. What really is creating a problem here is that it's adding sulfur. You can see the yellow color look. That's sulfur. So that's one of the six building blocks of life that's usually not found in streams and that's kind of one of the holdbacks that keeps a cyanobacteria and other uh, uh, atrium biomass uh, producers from developing. And so phosphorus is another one, nitrogen is another one. So these are the things that cause the pollutant that people normally look at. Streams are polluted, lakes are polluted, and basically those are the three main things. Sulfur so is not a limiting factor in Lake County for Clear Lake. So the popular nutrient uh, culprits that everybody believe is causing the problem in their mind for the lake, even though it's the most productive lake in the world, uh, they, they look at it as a problem because it's not what they expect because it has a cyanobacteria. Well, they believe off-road vehicles cause it, illegal grows call, cause it, agriculture, unpaved roads, sewage, septic inputs, fires, and of course the sulfur bank mine, and there's little data that really quantify any of it to say that those are the main problems. <clears throat> what, uh, what makes the lake work? Wind. As there's little stratification in this shallow lake. There's no cold water bottom, hot water top, and then a kind of a turnover of the lakes and these two-story lakes, uh, that sort of thing. It's all well mixed. There's a lot of wind that blows through here on a consistent basis. Just something to show you. The wind doesn't blow through and touch the lake in every place. It can actually bounce. So it hits the lake here, it bounced over and hit the lake there and it's blowing. That bounce area uh, doesn't show any ripples and that will kind of move along <laughs> because it's kind of a, a, a cascade or a sequence of uh, wind uh, events. So that's just how to read that slide. But that's all ripple area there. It's called Bernoulli waves. And that basically is showing how it's hitting the lake. The next thing is that when the wind sets up a steady uh, course across the top of the lake, you're going to see little foam lines. Have anybody seen the little foam lines that looks like striations? That's called Langmuir lines. They're there almost all the time when the wind's blowing and hitting the lake, but you see it when you get the foam. The foam basically shows you how much froth there is, and that's the organics that are dissolved in the lake. So what you're looking at is the organics that are just streaking across the top of the lake. This is called Langmuir Convergence, and if you want to look it up, uh, it shows how the cyclic effect happens from the wind. So I just wanted to give you that in case there's anybody that wants to look up uh, Irvin Langmuir. <clears throat> so how does the lake respond to the well-mixed nutrient input? This is the way it is. Nutrients affect the amount of biomass that the lake can produce. Biomass, that total living stuff that uh, eats up that nutrient, is the smallest phytoplankton, cyanobacteria, and bacteria up to the aquatic weeds, the fish, the birds, the amphibians, the reptiles, and the mammals. And this is all called the web of life. And it's very, very complex. It's all interrelated. And so that's what I studied as a freshwater ecologist back in the day, looking at these cycles and trying to determine how those cycles actually interrelated and what caused them to move. 
So what are some of the other things to consider before we lose our head? <laughs> Spectral interpretation of satellite images. This is absolutely amazing. Different algorithms using data from satellite spectral imaging platforms can determine what significant levels of a bunch of stuff, phosphorus, nitrogen, cyanobacteria, or other components of the lake. It's really neat. So what I want to show is what comes in during the winter. This is an external loading of just phosphorus. That's one of the things that is nutrients that things need, it's phosphorus. And this shows that imaging then interpreted using a spectral analysis. A fantastic tool. So one winter storm <clears throat> in uh, 20 or 12, 24, 2012, uh, I, and I know this all because I ordered this up. I knew uh, what happened that particular year. It cost us um, 2,500 bucks, I think, for the company to actually do this analysis for us. What we wanted to see was where is it coming from, and is it phosphorus really part of the component? So this is turbidity in the water analyzed for phosphorus. So what you can see is the major component coming in through Middle Creek. There's also components that's coming in from all of this valley uh, agricultural area here. But there's also some hill stuff that's here. Uh, basically, these hills are eroding because of off-road vehicles. And then there's a little bit down here that comes in at the bottom end. <clears throat> now, here it is in May. Actually, that phosphorus and all that uh, turbidity settles out during the um, during February or during the after the early rain so during February and March April it's gone by May everything is settled out there's no more phosphorus coming in you're in the spring you're not going to get any more rainstorm so no more rain and now let's look at the next slide basically says what happens during the summer the phosphorus comes in the winter and settles out it's not available for anything it's called internal loading, and it's caused by hypoxia. That's low oxygen in the sediments that release the phosphorus and other nutrients into the water column. It's also because of the high temperatures in the lake. In the summertime, the temperatures can get above 80 degrees very easily. 85 degrees, we've seen some very high temperatures. That creates some of that hypoxia. So the hypoxia is caused by decaying vegetation, other organics that's in the sediment. So let's look at a summer nutrient loading in July. Here is a clear lake in seven, uh, July 7th. This one happens to be 2011. <clears throat> and this is a clear lake with all this uh, cyanobacteria that's pushed into these bottom areas here from the wind coming this way. The next slide shows the phosphorus. Now, where did the phosphorus come from? It came up out of the sediment into the water column. The cyanobacteria loves that because it's available to them. They take it up through what's called luxury uptake because they don't, ordinarily don't get it out of the water column. When they're on the surface, they get it out near where it is on the bottom. And that luxury uptake then allows them to bloom faster than the other species and to completely take over the lake as a result. That's why you see your cyanobacteria blooms. So what we have to do is find out more about this cycle of Phosphorus coming up out of the sediment in the summertime. So what to do? Uh, AB 707, Aguiar Curry established the Blue Ribbon Committee to make recommendations to the legislature. And under this bill, UC Davis will conduct studies to inform what's called that Blue Ribbon Committee. And they have about $2 million to do it. The Blue Ribbon Committee is composed of local governments, the counties, the cities, the tribes, special interest groups, which are the agriculture, tourism and business. And so why is this important? The world's fifth largest economy is California, right? Actually, the fifth largest economy is located in 23 urban and suburban counties, not all over California. The 35 rural counties, like Lake County, is actually a developing country's economy. Some say third world for some of them. That's why we got left behind. 23 counties is where it's all happening. Over here, not so much. And so each rural economy is based on natural and human attributes. So Lake County is no different. So let's look at those attributes. <clears throat> what all of the 35 counties have are timber, mining, accessibility, that would be your transportation corridors, that sort of thing, skiing, 
fishing, hiking, view shed, history, bird watching, clean air, waters, lakes, and streams. You can't sell that on the world economy unless people come here and visit from the world. Now, there's also a human attribute, a welcoming people, nice neighborhoods, low crime, low drug rates, public safety and facilities, parks, trails, museums, lakes, recreational access, and activities. All of the 35 rural counties have something like this that basically holds their economy together. And Clear Lake, <clears throat> unfortunately, has a reputation of pollution. So it's deserved or not, we need a, a plan to change that perception because our economy is going to be based on these attributes. And that's the biggest attribute that everybody knows about in this county. Go ahead. Oh, no. <clears throat> what must be done? We need three things. Active lake and watershed management. We've never done that. Monitoring to determine nutrient inputs. We've never done that. Restore wetlands and tules. We've been trying for 20 years on that one project. And we're halfway done. We've only bought 50% of the land in order to restore it. We have to have 100% of the land. Then we have to go after the dollars to actually get it funded to do the restoration. And so basically, up till now, the county has been a little bit too late about its management. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. The next slide will show you that what we need to do is all get together and talk about this and get it to happen. And that's really the, what's going on with Clear Lake. All of those things are underway to some degree, and that's what I've been working on for the last four years. <laughs> the active uh, watershed part is basically monitoring where there's a feedback loop, because as you can see, the upper watershed is what affects the lake. And what happens from the upper watershed doesn't start to affect the lake till much, much later, when in fact you get the warm temperatures, you get the anoxic condition, then you get the, the, the stuff coming up out of the sediment, the phosphorus and a lot of other things, you get a lot of nitrogen. So what you have to do is understand how long the residence time is for that. So what's the residence time? If it's cycling there and coming around all the time, you get a little bit of loss. It goes out through the dam, it, comes, it gets locked up in this heavy metals and stuff like that. We'll lock up with it, it gets locked up in the sediment. Only the top four inches actually comes up into the water column. So as more stuff comes in the top, you want it to be clean stuff without phosphorus. You want to have the stuff come out of the four inches and not be replaced. So with all of that, the lake management is management by uh, monitoring and making sure you understand how the whole lake works. From the standpoint of the watershed management, once you understand how long it takes for this stuff to pass through, let's say the residence time is four years. All of it's going to be gone in four years. Well, <clears throat> you want less than one-fourth coming in each year. It's kind of simple math. Unfortunately, we don't know the residence time. It could be 400 years. It could be 40 years. It could be any number. And that's never been studied. That's one of the things that we wanted to have studied was what's the residence time for the nutrients so we know how much to tell everybody to keep from let coming in. How sensitive is this lake? And that's really what the yin-yang is right now with working with UC Davis, trying to get them to do the right things. And then the other thing, the monitoring is to determine nutrient inputs. If you know where it's coming from in the 26 sub-watersheds, around the lake. If you know where it's coming from, you can say that particular activity is creating a problem for us and we have to have policies to slow that, po that problem down. If it's off-road vehicles running all over the side of the hill, we're going to have to do something about that because that's creating a problem during these winter storms. And these winter storms are driven not by steady rains. These winter storms are just, uh, driven by, as far as the lake is concerned, by these huge events it gets a lot of energy behind it, it keeps the sediment suspended, and it delivers it to the lake. And that's really can load the lake for a number of years. And so we don't know how much the lake can be loaded before it'll happen for a number of years. That particular loading event may last for a long time. And so that's the active management. You have to get some science in this. And the science hasn't been there till now. And then, of course, you have to do the re restoration of the natural attributes in the upper watershed. They've taken out, they've, they've created high-speed areas for water. So it comes off the road, it's got a lot of power, it can pick up sediment, and it can move it down into streams. What you really want to do is slow water down, make sure it's spread out, and that it soaks into the ground, and then it'll come into the streams through the groundwater attributes, 
It'll come through those streams, and then your streams will last longer into the summer instead of drying out so early. Your fish that go up those streams will have a better way of uh, doing their business, their uh, bioactivity. All of that spawning, all of that can happen in a natural cycle. We won't have listed uh, hitch anymore and the rest of it. Uh, there's also a sucker that goes up into the streams. So we have to slow the water down, get it to soak up, make sure the wetlands work, make sure the meadows work, make sure we don't have high speed off ramps with the roads and the rest of it. So active management means learning the process, learning the science, and then having policies in place and programs in place that start going back the other way. We've been going the wrong way, and we keep adding these areas where the water collects, runs off of hard surfaces, and gets into streams with a lot of energy behind it. And there's ways to do that to slow it down. It's all been studied. It's all well known. Uh, Europe has been doing it for years. We're just now starting to catch up. So that's the active management part. There's a lot of training to citizens. You want to want to have uh, classes for your young people to go to so they grow up with it. Uh, and that's all on the horizon, but it hasn't happened yet. Good question. What groups in the county are most contributing to uh, resolving the issues? Well, the tribes are very much involved because they do a lot of uh, uh, testing of the water to see if it's toxic. And that toxic uh, question mark will bring the issue up so that people can see it's an imperative. I think that's very useful. Uh, as far as any other groups, the only one that's on the, the table right now that I know of is the Wool Ribbon Committee, and that uh, has been set up by AB 707, and that was a long time in coming. There is a couple of studies uh, that have been doing going on for a number of years. These are basically monitoring. This was by the Department of Water Resources. Uh, nobody seemed to be using the information, so they stopped a few years ago and nobody was looking. And so that whole program disappeared. Uh, so what groups are left? Well, you had all of the research that was done, 30 years worth of research by UC Davis and others, Berkeley, uh, that stopped in the 90s. And all there's been since then has been Berkeley's study where they came up and did some drilling and to look at how deep was the lake so they could determine the age and try to determine how the changes are in the watershed. But Blue Ribbon Committee is it as far as I know. Are there NGOs or non-governmental groups that are uh, working to improve conditions uh, within the county? Um, you, you know, everybody is uh, with their awareness. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure they all are. Everybody that's on that Blue Ribbon Committee are participating in their own way. The Wine Alliance is in there. The, uh, there's the um, uh, economic uh, structure people that are looking at the economy of the county. There's uh, the farm group that's in there. There's a lot of people, the Native Americans in there, they have almost all their tribes that are hooked up with it. Uh, there's the special districts that is looking at drinking water issues. Uh, there's Regional Water Quality Control Board, which has put a uh, TMDL, which is Total Maximum Daily Load Limit re Restriction on the lake. So those are the kinds of groups, of course, that's government. But there are a lot of people that are interested in any special group. I don't know about it. So I'm getting a hook. Since 1929, our third Wednesday of the month, Middletown Luncheon Club provides great food, quality community gathering, and interesting local speakers. Come join us.